Hello, welcome to uh, September 24th, 2022. My name is Kurt, and this is my daily Good Life Meditation. It's a video that I make each and every day to make sure that I'm, well, not to make sure. It's a video that I, I well, why do I do it? <laughs> well, the exercise, in fact, is not the video. The exercise is the um, behavior and activity of thinking about my life, objectives and principles, a collection that I call The Good Life, to borrow from the Stoics. Um, and the video is a means by which I do a better job. I discovered years ago that uh, if I just do this in my head, I do it very quick and perfunctory. I can get it done within probably two, two and a half minutes. <laughs> I don't do a good job. If I do it aloud, speaking aloud, then the very act of uh, speaking uh, retards and slows my thinking, and uh, I do a better job as a result. If I do it uh, with a camera on, with the intent of uploading, I do a much better job and more thorough and complete, knowing that um, there's a potential that someone might actually see it. So, you know, your, your, my ego gets in the way. I, I don't want to do a poor performance, and that helps to make me do a better job. And... Um, Doing a better job of this is, is, is a good thing because this is the endeavor. This is the point, of the in, not the point of my life, but is the endeavor that helps me to sharpen and um, put an edge on the point of my life. Feels like that. So first I'll go over last night and yesterday. Then I will relate the Good Life Creed. Seven Objectives and 32 Principles. Then I'll talk about the coming day. So first, last night and yesterday. I slept really good last night. I stayed up a little later than I usually do. But I, I just did I did something I, I, I enjoy, but I, it's, it's, a, it's a petty, fun pleasure. But I, I, I like it a little bit. Um, it's uh, just scrolling through Instagram feed. You can just, it's a bottomless pit. Right? You just scroll, scroll. You never know what you're going to see with the next one. Um, less so, I know it's the same company, but less so with uh, the Facebook feed. It's those little, those little, excuse me, it's those little shorts, those little short videos that get you, you know, a little bit of humor, a little bit of dancing, a little bit of, uh, you know, this and that, usually with utter, utter strangers. It was a very voyeur, voyeur, voyeuristic voyeur quality to that experience. And sometimes it's fun just to do. And I did that. I laid in bed and just shh, 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 until I fell asleep. It's very rare that I do that. Usually I'm very deliberate in my sleep. I just get in bed and I go to sleep. Because <laughs> I get up early, 4 a.m. Uh, oh, I hope, by the way, I need to put a battery in that clock. It's stuck at 8.20. Um, so, anyways, yesterday was a good day. I was down in Orange County looking for a place for Yumiko and I to live. I had success. I had a breakthrough for one apartment that I think might be a great place for us. And I looked at a couple of others, and then I came home and I crunched the numbers for the budget, trying to figure out how that all that would stand with uh, supporting Emily in college. It's a, it's a tricky time for us right now, financially, to do support two basically two households at once and tuition and everything else. So I'm uh, trying to figure out which of the apartments would work best for us. Good day. And then uh, we're going to do the same thing today, although Miko will join me today. So as soon as she's up, um, uh, we'll do that. So I've got a couple more hours here. I can finish this, upload this. Uh, I'm not talking about today yet. Kurt, you're getting ahead of yourself talking about yesterday. Good day yesterday. Did I have many opportunities to exercise the good life? Not in particular, although I definitely... Had it on my mind all day. I was. It was like being waiting for him to be pounced on by a tiger. I imagine that's what it's like to like work or travel through the forests of of uh, of regions where tigers exist, right? I mean, you must be on the alert for that. That's how I felt yesterday. I didn't get. I didn't get jumped. In fact, I, I did. It was a really good day. Yesterday was a model day. In a way, a model day for, was it a model day because um, I exercised stoic virtue? 
was it a model day because I just had got lucky and didn't get ambushed by anything? Um, perhaps both. I mean, I, I didn't get ambushed, and I was definitely on my guard. I ran across a, a curious, a curious uh, statement from Epictetus. I wish I had the book. I should keep my Epictetus book here that I'm reading that changed my perspective a little bit on uh, Stoic uh, apathy. Um, I've always read and considered apathy to be the thing that we would apply with regard to stoicism to that which is outside of our control. And I like to pull out examples like like a sudden rainstorm, if caught outdoors without an umbrella, suddenly it's rain. I'm not going to rail at the skies. I'm simply going to say, wow, okay, I'm going to get wet. And I'm, I will use stoic apathy to uh, address that, maybe find a tree to stand under or a bus stop. But uh, that's what I thought about apathy. But then I was reading a chapter, um, it was the chapter of Epictetus in book, I think it's in book one, it's the last chapter of book one of his discourses. And I think the title, I'm amazed I can remember this, I think the title was um, I'm Having Tools, something like that, Having Tools of Use. It's very short, two pages. I had to read it like the chapter before it on courage. I read the chapter before on courage like four times because I just couldn't understand it. I had to read it, read it, read it, read it again, and I still don't understand it, but I did pull some nuggets out of it. But anyway, the one about the tools, he said something, and I can almost quote it out of memory. It was like it was a, it was like a dialogue, and the, the one thing was, and to, to what is it? Now it's not coming to me. Well, let me just, just hold on a second. Yeah, this is the chapter. It's very short. It's not even two pages. One, one in a little bit up here. Maybe one page. Weapons ready for difficult occasions is what it is. Um, and it'll just, just read it. Here we go. When are you going before? And it takes a lot of Epictetus's discourses take place like a dialogue between two people. When you are going before any of the great, remember that there is another who sees from above what passes and whom you ought to please rather than man. He therefore asks you, In the schools, what did you use to call exile and prison and chains and death and calumny? I, in different things. What then do you call them now? Are they at all changed? No. Are, are you changed then? No. Tell me then, what things are indifferent? Things not dependent on our own moral purpose. What is the inference? Things not dependent on my own moral purpose are nothing to me. Tell me, likewise, what appeared to be the good of man? Rectitude of moral purpose and a proper use of appearances. What was the end? To follow thee. Do you say the same things now, too? Yes, I do say the same things, even now. Well, go, in then boldly, and mindful of these things, and you will show the difference between the instructed and the ignorant. I imagine, indeed, that you will have such thoughts as these. Why do we make such elaborate preparations for nothing? Is the power, the antechamber, the attendants, the guards, no more than this? Is it? For these that I have listened to so many dissertations, these are nothing, and yet I had prepared myself as for some great encounter. So that's the chapter, Weapons Ready for Difficult Occasions. And I must admit that it's still struggling with this one. It's clearly a discussion between uh, the deity and a man. The thing that got me, and I actually under, I outlined it here in yellow, and actually made I pulled it out and made a, a quote to share on Stoic Poetry, uh, which is my branded, you know, uh, Facebook page for Stoic-related uh, bits and pieces. It says, this one right here, these two lines. Tell me then, what things are indifferent? Things not dependent on our own moral purpose. Now, that struck me. 
that's a very different way of thinking about apathy than merely recognizing the rain coming down that you, you can't control. Ind indifference is what is worth in indifference is things that are not related to our moral purpose. And I had to, I was walking yesterday while I was reading this and I was, had to close the book and think, what is, what does that mean? What is my moral purpose? Well, fortunately, I have my good life creed, which has a, has a, a purpose, a principle called the principle of purpose. So I look to that and there are three sub principles, biology, virtue, and mission. Biology being my efforts of being a good husband and father so that I can get my genes, my alleles into another generation to successful adulthood, to, to, sustain, to self sustainable viability on her own, my daughter. Um, so that I'm prepared to die and get the hell out of the way. So that's my one purpose. Um, the second one is to be a virtuous man, pursuing after virtue. What is virtue? Virtue is the uh, is the improvement of the well-being of thinking creatures. Happiness, basically. Happiness not at the expense of others, right? I mean, happiness when would cause others to suffer would defeat the purpose. So virtue or where all, all ships are rising. And then, uh, the, you know, a, a tide that rises all ships as many as possible. Um, and certainly not at the expense of any. Uh, and then uh, the third one is um, whatever purpose I endeavor to, ch to in undertake in life my, for my personal agenda, which is the sharing of my book, Going Alone. So if apathy is to be applied to things that are not related to my moral purpose, then I can be apathetic, and this is where I'm still struggling with, apathetic to anything that is not related to my efforts to be a good husband and father. And that includes my, my, my participation in work as a citizen, as a taxpayer, all that stuff, because that contributes to the environment, the infrastructure, the superstructure of society. That's a lot, right? I, I'm not indifferent to any of that. That's a lot. <laughs> Um, I'm not indifferent to the improvement of well-being. Again, all of that. And then the promotion of my book. Interesting. That would be an attention more to the details related to how I can share the story of going alone and the Good Life Creed. So what then am I indifferent to? kind of feels like you can't be indifferent to anything. I'm different. I'm indifferent to things like a flat tire. Am I? How does a flat tire in any way relate to my moral purpose? Yes, it does. Because part of my moral purpose is to behave well and to remain an efficient, efficient cog in the system. And handling a flat tire with stoic resolve and, and self-control maintains the machinery of society better. Using indifference to recognize that I could not control that event does the same. What else? How about disease? Again, the same. It doesn't improve the well-being of my, the, my it doesn't it doesn't improve my efforts at fatherhood and husbandry, or as citizen or citizenry. If I complain and rail and get upset and fight against a weathering disease, but a, it's an improved endeavor and example if I can bear it well. Wow, it's not that it's not related then that it's um, efficiency, isn't it? Stoicism is efficiency.
All right, <clears throat> let's do the good life. My seven objectives are as follows. One is to be always ready to die, to have my, uh, my life affairs, my relationships, and my purpose in, in order, ready to go. Two is to uh, make good and effective use of my time, to not waste my days. Three is to develop and maintain good and sound life principles so that I have a solid foundation upon which to base my life endeavor. Four is to cultivate good emotional reactions so that I react well to the day-to-day. -day. Five is to perform good actions, just to do good things throughout the day, or good is defined as seeking after the improvement of the well-being of thinking creatures, virtue in short. Six is to recognize my true limits and my true opportunity so that I'm uh, working in accord with the things that I can actually have some, some influence over. And finally, number seven is to uh, do just one thing at a time and to do that thing slowly, deliberately, carefully. All right, now my 32 principles. These are, number one, war. To always be fighting against what I think is true and what others propose to me that I should believe is true. Two, reason and the sub-principles of honesty, objectivity, doubt, and humiliation. To be upfront with myself, looking at things from as many sides as possible to be skeptical, and to be ready to onboard and carry any humiliation that I might encounter as a result of discovering that I'm wrong. Next is the homunculus, the suggestion that I do not have a soul, none of us do, but instead we have a consciousness. Next is the anchor hold, the idea that the consciousness, the homunculus, is quite mortal. And not only that, quite alone. Each of us suffers, exists, and dies on our own, despite all the efforts we make to uh, connect and get close to others. Ultimately, uh, we're all on a little island by ourselves, and one day each of us will fall into the sea. Next comes purpose. My purpose are three. To be a good husband and father. To be a man of virtue, where again, virtue is defined as seeking after the improvement of the well-being of thinking creatures. And then to promote my uh, story, the story of going alone and the good life creed. Next is the atomic principle. Everything is made of bits and pieces atoms, molecules, compounds. And these will fall to pieces very soon once we die. And that's the end of us. But our stuff gets reused, goes on either as matter or energy, on and on and on. But not for us. Then comes the principle of nature. Everything has some particular nature. And it's a good thing to be aware of the nature of things so that we can be prepared for how things will behave, how things will go, and to be able to um, formulate our responses accordingly and where necessary to abide the nature of the universe. Then comes the pirate ride, a funny name for a principle where I simply suggest that free will is an illusion. We really feel like we're making choices, but in fact, the universe has a lot to say, maybe everything to say, with our, uh, our will, our seeming will. Next is maturity and the sub-principles of wisdom, fortitude, and integrity. We are mature when we wisely remember 
our past successes and failures, have the fortitude, the strength to do better, and the integrity of aligning our uh, our act, our choices and our actions with uh, um, our our values. Then comes the social principle. We're social creatures. We need each other. The sub principles here are diplomacy, justice. Conspiracy. Diplomacy because we need to use diplomatic skills to work out our differences. Justice because we want to create institutions and build a build build a, an, a state <laughs> in which uh, we can weed out uh, right from wrong, decided right from wrong, the right and wrong that we decide, and uh, seek after some justice for one another. And then conspiracy, when we work, have worked together through diplomatic means to create a system of justice and then link arms to make that happen and to build a better city. Next comes public speaking, a reminder to uh, speak and write well and carefully. And I think there's four sub-principles here, maybe five, and I'm toying with adding a new one. These are best words, using the best words for the moment, having a good vocabulary, a good rich vocabulary, but then trying to find the right words. Best words. Prudence. Prudence is the ability to, in the, on the moment, in the, on, in the fly, on the fly, to be able to pick out the right words and sentiments so that what we're communicating aligns with our values. It's the same thing as the integrity, but the integrity is the after the fact is the after the fact, right? The prudence is the is the engine of uh, of deciding as we go. Prudence is the more difficult thing. Integrity is the result. Prudence strives towards integrity. There you go. And then the last two parts of that are rumor and gossip. These are things I don't want to do. I don't want to trade in rumor, and I don't want to gossip about other people. I'm talking about them behind their back. So I avoid those things. And that's, that's helpful, good, good practice, best practice for speaking and communicating. Okay, so next is, uh, I believe the next one is temperance. Let me check. I have a tendency to stray in my principles sometimes, not just in their application, but in their recitation as well. Oh, I was going to add, yeah, I knew I was going to add one to public speaking. That's eloquence. There it is right there. I had penciled it in. Seek after eloquence. Practice will, practice can yield eloquence in speech and writing. Yeah, it is temperance. So that's the start of uh, the big one. That's the fiver. Temperance, life will not go well, the horror show, that which must be born, and the feast of woeful. Temperance is our ability to control our actions, our consumption, our thoughts even. Putting on the, the thro throttling down and breaking a little bit, you know, you know, stopping so that we're not doing anything to excess, not too much work or play or uh, food or drink, uh, anything at all. Temperance. Having the ability to exercise temperance in all things gives us self-control, which is going to be useful for the rest of the objectives as well as the ones I've already mentioned, the principles, that is, towards the objectives. So that's temperance. The next is life will not go well. Things are going to happen. Speed bumps, upset, difficulty, little pains, frustrations, not feeling good, hard day at work, the dogs are barking, whatever the case, the kids are crying, all of that. Life will not go well. That's a fact. The horror show is just a life will not go well to the nth degree when it really gets bad. Horror level stuff. Tornado takes out a house, flooding flooding that destroys a city. Uh, cancer ravages a body. Um, you know, a terrible automobile accident. Sometimes I, I take a moment here to, in the spirit of Epictetus, think about horrible things that could happen in my life. I think I'm going to skip that today. <laughs> so I'll move on. Sometimes I just can't take it. And it causes me to say four-letter words because it pisses me off. 
Okay, after the horror show comes uh, uh, that which must be born, born with an E, carried. What we have to bear is the uh, fact of the horror show and the fact that life will not go well. Just get used to it. That's a big helpful principle to me. I remember it every day when things don't go well. I tell, oh, there you go. I have to bear this. It's part of my adult, my adult burden. Then finally comes the Feast of Woeful. Feast of Woeful is when we do not bear well. We do, we do not bear life. And we get upset and throw it all out. Now, the better we can do at bearing life, the better, the less chance, less likely we are to be to have a, engage in the Feast of Woeful and hurt others through our upset and tantrums and words, etc. Very immature thing to do. Okay, good. I got through all that. I think the next one is distraction or the best seat in the house. Let's see. Distraction. Twofer. Distraction and agency in the great indifference. We spend our lives distracting ourselves with all kinds of stuff. Our school and our job and our friends and our family and our hobbies and our sports and our church and our God. All so that we don't have to see the next principle, the great indifference, which is the emptiness that pervades the universe beyond the pale of our influence, the pale of influence of life. Um, it's basically the evidence, the apparent, the, the absence of evident evidence. That's a good way to say it, the absence of the evidence of God. <laughs> I like the way that rolls off the tongue. The absence of the evidence of God. So we don't want to see that. At least a lot of us don't want to see that. Because that means two things. That means three things, really. The third one's the worst. It means we're alone. Which means we're responsible for our own. We're responsible for ourselves. No one's looking after us. And it means that when we die, that's it. So... Back to the distraction. We do all these things so that we don't have to see that. Cover our ears, close our eyes, speak really loudly, keep ourselves so busy so that we don't have to look at that and realize uh, it's just us, one another. We've got our pets too and a, an ecosystem that sustains and supports us. Um, and then each of our consciousness, our homunculi, are here for just a short while, very soon to wink out, never to come back. It's a heavy thought. So no wonder we distract ourselves and tell ourselves otherwise. I mean, that's I, I, I was going to say that's fine, but it's not fine because it's, uh, it's not, doesn't seem to be real. Uh, that's why people have to turn to things like faith and, uh, and uh, personal testimony and uh, personal relationships, etc. All these, all these for, you know, frail supports for systems of belief that otherwise couldn't withstand uh, uh, the scrutiny of reason. That harms all of us, because we wind up living in a world that may not be quite real. Not of this world, as they say, right? Focusing on, on an afterlife that most likely won't come, and uh, removing ourselves from the, the, the challenge and the, the effort and responsibility of the here and now. So my book encourages people to face it down, to go alone, to see the emptiness, and then to do something about it, to live better, to live, to seek after the good life, so to speak. So that's two for their distraction, agency, and the great indifference. Now the next one's, uh, I think it's a threefer or a fourfer. The restless man, the threefer. The restless man, the path of wildness, the great life adventure. The restless man or woman uh, is that person who, you know, around, you know, t late teens, early 20s, starts to feel restless, wants something out of life. That's typically some adventure. The path of wildness is 
the thing that you do when you go out and have that adventure, when you make the break from the status quo, you decide, I'm going to give up this comfortable, beautiful house and have to try something different. And then the great life adventure is what is yielded in results from stepping upon the path of wildness. The great life adventure becomes a, a centerpiece story of our lives. And you can have more than one. You can have big ones, little ones, small ones too. And the more you have, the more rich and diverse your life will be. In after a while, it kind of almost becomes more important than the stuff of the trappings of life. Like I can easily give up these things, this house, etc. It is uh, I, I have much a greater craving for the the experience of new and interesting and different. I know that you know I have less than twenty summers left in me, most likely. So I want to get the most out of them, and far less than twenty good ones, to be sure. So those are the three, and I recommend, if you are a restless man or a woman, to hop on the path of wildness early in life. Go to college, finish college, drop your diploma off with mom and dad, and then head out. And don't come back until you're 30, and then come back bruised, beaten, broke. You might even die, and it's not so bad. And then... Uh, you will have had your great life adventure, and that's going to help you assuage something that I'll call and I'll call out in just a second, which is the deep level risk of life. But we'll get to that. After those three come, you know, uh, restless man, path of wildness, great life adventure. Is it the risk of avoiding risk? The very next one, which which would be nice if that's the case, because that means it flows good. Restless man, path of wildness. The risk, it is. Okay, that is, I should really make that a four for, because the restless, the risk of avoiding risk goes with that. If you don't do all that stuff I just said about the path of wildness and the great life adventure, then you might wind up missing out the chance to do something about the deep risk of life. So the risk of avoiding risk is the principle that says there's two levels of risk in life. Okay, the surface level and the deep. The reason I call it surface level is not because it's easy, it's just because that all of our institutions of society are set up to help us to pursue these. These risks are education, career, family, home, security. Our whole society is set up for this. Institutions, schools, banks, uh, career, uh, job places to work. Uh, churches, all this stuff is set up to help us to do, deal with all of that stuff. So, even though it's hard work, um, it's not. Uh, it's it's the thing that, that you're going you're going to get lots of encouragement and help for if you do it. The challenging one is the deep risk of satisfying that inner wanting and desire to have something more to discover ourselves to do something about that restless that restlessness inside of us. That's why I recommend the path of wildness and the great life adventure. If you don't do that at an early life, early age in life, you're going to be haunted. There's a man around the corner every day, not almost every day, when I walk the dogs in the evening. He's retired, and uh, I'm pretty sure. And uh, he's got a beautiful house, and he's got a big, beautiful truck in the garage and a nice SUV. I'm pretty sure the truck is his. The SUV is his wife. His garage is beautiful. The lawn is manicured. Everything is fine. And I don't know this man's story. I'm inferring things. I'm, I'm writing his story in my mind. So I could, be, I could, of course, be wrong. But this is the way I see it. He stands out there regularly with his garage door open. And he, he stares at the wall. I'm struck by that. What's he staring at the wall for? He stares at a blank wall. And if he sees me coming, or he senses that I'm coming, hears me coming, he'll look around, and then he'll kind of like pretend he's not looking at the wall, you know, like looking at something else. The only thing I can think and this is due to the other anecdotal evidence that I get from some of the other people, particularly the men around me, who describe themselves as having nothing to do in retirement. They've achieved it all. They've got the five, right? The, the career, the, the education, the career, the home, the family, and the security. 
but they never attended to that deep risk. And they don't know how to do it now. And they're too scared and old and frail, too wise. Because you need a little bit of stupidity, youthful stupidity, to have a good great life adventure. Hmm. So watch out with that. It can get you. If you wait. <laughs> I got another one here. Hold on. 3540. All right. Carrying on. After uh, the risk of avoiding risk comes this season. No, no, no. <laughs> what comes next? I lose my place. After the risk of avoiding risk comes the. Is it, oh, complete oblivion, I think. Let me check. Sin and damnation, thanks. God, I checked. Thanks to this, thanking myself. <laughs> Sin and damnation, there are seven sins in my worldview. Um, these are falsity, credulity, faith, superstition, dogma, authority, and gossip. I should add a rumor to that. I should make it eight. Let me go ahead and do that. Um, these are just sins against honesty, being honest with others or honest with ourselves and uh, being a, a poor, poor interlocutor with uh, other human beings, talking about them behind their back or telling them information that may or may not be true. I just try to avoid all that stuff. The damnation part comes because we're damned in the here and now. We're a damned, we're a damned uh, liar, we're a damned... Uh, we're a damned uh, gullible person, we're a damned gossip or a, or a or rumor monger, so to speak. The next one is complete oblivion after we're dead, since we have no soul, appears to be no God, no heaven or hell, no afterlife. After we're dead, that's it. So this is the only chance we get this time now to, to make up with, to reconnect with others, to have a, to reconnect and, and make, make amends with others, to, um, uh, Seek after justice. No, hap no final. There's no final reunion, no final reconciliation, and no final justice. So do it now. I think I can get to the end without the book. From here. So that was um, uh, complete oblivion, and then um, the season of philosophy. That's just a, a rem reminder to keep a pen and paper handy, like I do. In this case, it's a, a whiteboard and a, and a marker. So I'm not going to write down my ideas, because they'll come later, especially if you live a good life. A good life, a good, a good, well, it depends on what you define as good, right? For me, a good cerebral life is a good life. A good life of virtue, of course, obviously. The muse will uh, bless you with uh, ideas. Next comes, um, uh, after the season of philosophy, is the bullseye aim. Reminding myself that I'm going to strive for the mark, but I'll usually miss. Like today, I want to get the, finish this, upload this, read my Bible, take the dog for a walk, feed them. Yumiko should be out by then. We should be able to get ready. We're going to look at like four houses today and make an efficient decision of things, have a nice lunch together. That's the bull's aim. It won't go that way. It'll Life will get in the way. Things will happen. That's the way it goes. It's the bull's aim. Trying to get that bull's eye, realizing I'm probably going to miss the mark. A little bit off. Sometimes I'll miss the board altogether. Go off to the side. Uphill climb. Trudge, trudge, trudge. Life is a steady uphill climb. I want to be higher today than I was tomorrow. I'm not headed for any particular goal. But I'm climbing. Well, I am heading for the goal. The goal of the goal of the good life. That's what I am. But there is no end to the mountain until death. I guess the end mountain doesn't go any higher than like 115 years. Next is... Um, Arena and utility. Life is this arena where we can develop good principles to help us to achieve sound objectives. And then the last two principles. Nothing is enough. A suggestion, a reminder towards uh, getting by with less. And not rely it's not really getting by with less. It's relying on less, needing less. Distilling out the, the 
non-essential things, the non-essential parts of life. And then lastly, the principle of fun. I'm remembering this one more and more often. It's a reminder to enjoy life, to have a good time now, today. Also, to remember the good times of the past and to anticipate the good times to come. Like today, I am going to have a fun time with you, Nico. We're going to enjoy a nice drive down to Orange County. Um, we'll have fun time looking at different places. We'll have a good lunch together. Um, it's going to be fun. I'm not putting things off. I'm enjoying that time with her. I'm not going to worry about in, in, uh, uh, incidentals along the way. Or postpone that pleasure for some uh, fictitious tomorrow. All right, I made it through the Good Life Creed. Now, let's prepare for the day. I think I already said it. Finish this video. Up, start the upload. Read my Bible. Ezekiel again today. Dogs walk, feed the dogs, ready, and off we go. We make an effort to start our day. Thanks for joining me. Remember to be safe, but not too safe. Take care.